Chapter 24 Fly While You Can Dr. Lionel Gurney was a man of prayer, with a deep love for people, especially Muslims. It was more than twenty years since I had roomed with him while learning Morse in Khartoum. Since then his vision, like MAF's, had become a reality. The caring Christian medical work of his Red Sea mission team had spread to several countries, including the Danakil Desert and the Red Sea coast in the northeast of Ethiopia. We had the privilege of serving them there with our planes. Some of their lonely stations were staffed by women. Some were in bandit country. Some of the places they visited were in scorching areas below sea level. We admired their dedication. In another desert area, this time in the far south, Bob and Maurice Swart, previously in Sudan, were working at Omo, amongst the Gallup people. I always remember their airstrip, distinctively marked out in the sands with lines of bleached cattle skulls and bones, a reminder that life in that region was hard. For several years they lived in tents in the hot, windy desert while they built a clinic and a school. Only then did they start a house for themselves. Even building supplies had to be flown in by air when new work was being developed. Chebera was 140 miles north of Omo and in Ethiopia's western mountains. In a single day, Tom Frank and Les Brown made 30 landings there with bags of cement to enable the mission building to be started. Like Omo in the desert and many other pioneer locations, Chebera in the high mountains relied entirely on air support for its communications. In another mountain area, airstrips were opened on the plateaus north of Addis Ababa. The Southern Baptist Mission started an agricultural and medical care program among the Amhara. Places that had previously taken days to reach by Land Rover were now reached in minutes. One mission had the official policy. Travel by MAF. It's too dangerous by road. When we started work in Ethiopia in early 1960, three quarters of our missionary passengers were foreign, only one in four Ethiopian. By 1970, that ratio was reversed. For every foreign missionary, we now carried four Ethiopians, going to show and tell the love of God to tribes other than their own. This certainly represented the pattern for the future. Churches were becoming established in more and more areas, amongst more and more tribes, and they were constantly reaching out. For example, a long way to the west lived the Shankila, a downtrodden people whose name means slave, part of the huge Oromo tribe, who represent nearly 40% of the people in Ethiopia, had pushed up from the south forcing the Shankilla towards Ethiopia's relatively inaccessible western border. As the Christian church grew among the Oromo, however, its leaders became concerned to reach the previously despised Shankilla with the gospel. MAF planes flew them in. The town of Bonga was perched in high, heavily forested mountains in the southwest. It was a very logical base from which to reach half a dozen different tribes. There were some quarter of a million people within a fifty-mile radius. Yet the SIM missionary there had to struggle to contact even two or three of these tribes a month. He could get only a few miles along the mountain trails in his four-wheel drive Toyota. He could then go a little further by mule. After that, he had to scramble long distances on foot through high trees and thick bush. Bonga did have an airstrip, and we used it to link the station to other main centres. But we could not fly to the close-by villages, as there was nowhere to land. One day, a salt trader from an outlying village called Cheta came to Bonga and heard the gospel. It made such an impression on him that he begged for someone to be sent to his own valley. The church at Bonga dispatched an Ethiopian missionary who trekked across the mountains and found the people responsive. 
Trekking back, he demanded, Can't we have an airstrip at Cheta? Then we could get in and stay amongst the people and do better work. One of our pilots found a suitable site there. Villagers helped clear it, and we started flights from Bonga. The Ethiopian Christian, who had first been sent there, was flown in with his family. The church at Bonga also sent in a teacher. Soon, Cheta had a school with a hundred pupils and its own church. Much the same happened at surrounding villages. Across the mountainous ridges around Bonga, ten satellite airstrips were established. Each village had its own church. Some had their own satellite churches as well. It was dramatic to see the positive change in the people. Only air travel had made it possible to maintain regular contact with the churches and evangelists. There were similar developments elsewhere. After ten years at Gadari, Harvey and Levina Hookstra moved out to Tepe, some fifty-five miles away. This became a centre for reaching new areas among the Majang and other tribes, with eight new airstrips around it. Sometimes Harvey himself flew out to them. More often, the plane carried teams of Ethiopian evangelists and medical dressers who stayed in these areas for several days. Whenever they went to collect these men, our pilots heard their enthusiastic reports of people who'd become Christians during their visit, sometimes as many as thirty or forty. Taking all the satellite outreaches together, several hundred were becoming Christians every week. Harvey continued to provide a series of taped cassette messages for the evangelists to use. This was the beginning of a cassette tape ministry later employed in other parts of Ethiopia as well. Subsequently, he was to develop it further. It is now employed in many parts of Africa, India and beyond, with tapes in over thirty languages, including Russian. It all started at Kodari and Tepe. The church and missions had been increasingly planning their outreach around the availability of the plane. The number of our aircraft in Ethiopia had risen, first to three, then to four, later to five, six, and for a while, seven. New people had joined the work too. Then, after five years, Alistair MacDonald left to go to Chad, and Tom Frank took over as program manager. In 1970, Tom and his wife Penny moved to our UK office. Other new pilots and their families were still arriving. One couple was Vern and Lorraine Sycamore. We'd first known them in the 1950s, when Vern was mission agriculturalist at Alcobo. Since then, he had acquired considerable flying experience, and they joined our Ethiopian program. Another couple were Denny and Carol Hookstra. Denny was the eldest son of Harvey and Lavina. He'd been one of our earliest MK missionary kid passengers in Sudan and Ethiopia. He and Carol had become members of American MAF, and now they came to us to work in Ethiopia themselves. Then there was Max Gove, who arrived with his wife Sue and their first child. He was the schoolboy who had originally visited Steve and me in the Woodford office when he was only fourteen. With hard work and determination, he'd obtained the necessary licenses and fulfilled the early call he'd had from God. We already had an international team, British, American and Canadian. Now our first Scandinavian family came, the Kurkulas from Finland. Seppo Kurkula was an agriculturist, an accountant and a pilot, a very useful combination for MAF work in developing areas. By now, we had eight families in Ethiopia. The work there was at its peak. On the morning of 12th of September 1974, Vern Sycamore was flying back from Omo to the MAF home base at Jinnah. He radioed to give his expected arrival time. The reply he received was unexpected. 
Jimmer Airport has been officially closed, Fern. What am I supposed to do, stay up here all day? Stand by, we'll call the airport and let you know. Fifteen minutes later, the airport will be open, just for you. Then it'll be closed again. When Vern landed, he found the reason. Ethiopia had seen a military coup, the culmination of more than twenty years of growing ferment and discontent in that great but very mixed nation. Emperor Haile Selassie had been deposed. Everything began to change. The new military executive committee, the DERG, gradually took ruthless control. It soon became obvious that it was a Marxist body. At first, it seemed that the relative freedom of missionaries would not be affected. The work of the church, missions and MAF went on and was poised for further advance. However, by August 1976, we were reporting to our prayer partners, the Ethiopia flying program continues, but in an atmosphere of considerable uncertainty. We reduced our program fleet to five planes by sending one aircraft to the UK to be used in a special techniques course required for our flying. In Ethiopia, Stalinist-style terrors started to spread, as they had in the USSR. Atrocities and bloodshed abounded. Thousands died in Addis Ababa and throughout the country. The church suffered greatly. The derg was committed to its elimination. In September, the government, suspicious of our access to the troubled and divided country, grounded all our aircraft. Missionaries in remote places faced a difficult time. Several outposts had to be closed and the staff withdrawn. In mid-December, we were allowed to start flying again. But local anti-mission agitation, stirred up by the hostile government, continued to force many missionaries to leave the rural areas where much of our service was targeted. As a result, over the next four months, our flying dropped to less than 10% of its previous level. The inactivity was costly. In aviation, high overheads continue whether you fly or not. I visited Addis Ababa in January 1977 and talked with David Staveley, who was now our program manager there. Missionaries were facing increasing harassment and danger from the turmoil throughout the country. Rural outreach had stopped. Disturbances, executions and murders were increasing. I had to go to look at conditions in the Sudan, where we were considering the possibility of restarting work. But in London, I discussed the situation in Ethiopia with Tom Frank and asked him to visit there if necessary, as his previous extensive experience would be valuable in deciding what to do. Shortly afterwards, David Staveley requested that Tom should come. On arrival, Tom found the consensus of the missions, and of our own staff, was that MAF should leave. It was a difficult decision. If we waited, we might have all our aircraft confiscated by the Derg. Staying could no longer effectively help missions or churches. The restrictions were too many. David applied to the government for permission to fly our aircraft out of the country. Permissions were required for everything. We were in constant touch with our aircraft insurers at Lloyd's in London. We had put additional cover on our planes for war risks. The premiums had been reasonable, and we'd felt it was a wise precaution, even at a time of financial difficulty. Once we warned our insurers, however, that our planes were in danger of confiscation, they were not prepared to renew the war risk cover after its expiry on the 1st of June 1977. If our planes were confiscated or destroyed before that, they would have to pay, but not afterwards. It was touch and go whether we would get the exit permissions in time. At the last moment, in answer to many prayers, including those of the underwriters, I imagine, permission was given. It seemed a miracle. The insurers were relieved but the planes weren't out of the country yet. 
Three aircraft from Jimma flew up and joined two in Addis Ababa. It was the very last day of May when the planes gathered in front of the control tower to take off. Seppo Kurkula went to hand in the flight plans. The controller studied the stamped and signed permissions from the Civil Aviation Department. Ishi, ishi. Okay, okay, he said. Everything seems to be in order. He paused and looked up. But you want to take five aircraft out. You can't leave just like that. I must reconfirm these permissions before I let you go. Suspense. He dialed on the old black telephone. He managed to get through to the Civil Aviation Department. A conversation in Amharic followed. He put the phone down and smiled. You may go. The planes taxied out to the takeoff point and stood in line, one behind the other. The first plane called for clearance from the tower. It didn't come, at first, then at last it did. The second plane called for its clearance, but now the tower replied, Just go, go, go! The controller seemed in a hurry. He didn't want to wait for any more formalities. The five planes were soon flying in loose formation, southwestwards out of Addis Ababa, an unusual sight and sound in the early morning skies. Ethiopians below looked up and wondered what was happening. As the capital was left behind, our pilots listened on their radios, hoping there would be no call ordering them to return. Fortunately, none came. Towards the southern border of Ethiopia, however, other calls did come. Most people who had seen the planes flying over would not have known what it meant, but Bob and Maury Swart, the missionaries at isolated Omo, knew all too well. MAF had been their lifeline. Mike Alpha Fox, Mike Alpha Fox, came Maury's voice. She was using the MAF call sign as she made radio contact with the planes on the mission frequency. This is Omo River Station. We're sad to see you all leaving, but we are grateful you're able to get your planes out safely. We're praying for you. Goodbye. Other stations came on the air. They'd been listening out too. Their voices joined in the sad farewell. Seppo told me a long time later, I don't think I've ever been so moved as by those messages that day. The next day, one of Kenya's leading newspapers the East African Standard had a front-page banner headline, Five Mystery Planes Arrive from Ethiopia. It was a while before the Nairobi authorities understood what had happened. The aircraft were eventually dispersed to other programs. The staff were dispersed too. Some went on furlough. Some came back to the UK to stay. Others joined the operations in Kenya and Tanzania. It was the end of an era. In 17 years of work in Ethiopia, a network of routes had been established into almost 200 airstrips. Nearly 4 million miles had been flown. Many new areas had been penetrated and the church established in them. We'd assisted entry to more than 30 tribes. As one of our pilots said, By the time we prepared to leave, Nearly every unreached area had been touched with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Even though the aircraft were now withdrawn, bridgeheads had been made. The church had been planted in previously difficult or hostile areas. Its work could go on. At that time, God impressed on me that our motto should be, We must do all we can, where we can, while we can. It proved true in Africa. It applies to all of us, wherever we are, and whatever our stage of life. Two months before our fleet flew out of Ethiopia, Don McClure, the man whom God had used to call us back to Africa and to the Sudan nearly thirty years before, was killed. For some years he had been working among the Somalis. He had gone there originally, following a request from the emperor 
who wanted a large center established to help these troubled people in the extreme southeast near the border with Somalia itself. Now well past retirement age, he and Lyda had launched out to meet this new need. The end was abrupt. One night, Don heard that plundering Somali guerrillas were close by. Always generous, he told a fellow missionary, If they come here, I will give everything I own, rather than shoot one of them. They shot him, the one who'd come to help them. On that dark night, Don McClure completed almost fifty years of service in Africa. He had touched and affected many lives, including our own.